Thank you so much. Can y'all hear me? Is the mic working? All right? Yeah? Good. Okay, great. I'm like wired up here in multiple ways. It's a trope. Um, thank you so much, Ryan. Um, like Ryan mentioned, I uh, have just started teaching here. This is my first class I've ever taught um, and teaching a magazine and feature writing class. Uh, and it's been really a pleasure. My wife has worked at Ringling for about 20 years. I've uh, been in and around Ringling for a long time. I uh, worked on some freelance projects with people here. Have just always been so impressed with the talent of uh, the students, the staff, the faculty. Um, and it's just really cool to kind of be here with you all this evening. So thank you so much for coming out on Tuesday night to listen to someone talk about writing. Uh, which is an extremely kind of solitary pursuit, you know, but I think these are wonderful opportunities to kind of come together and um, feel energized and kind of get inspired. I know that whenever I um, get to talk about writing, I always kind of walk away feeling like um, I'm in, in a better place than I probably was going into it. Um, so I've been a journalist in Sarasota since about 2004. Um, I fell into it. Uh, I responded to an ad in a local alternative Newsweekly. Uh, it was called Creative Loafing. There's still one up in Tampa, and there used to be one here in Sarasota. And it was an unpaid internship to put together the listings of bands that played in the Sarasota area, like in the back. Um, this was the kind of newspaper you would pick up just to find out what cool shows were coming up, um, you know, what's going on around town, what's a cool new restaurant. Uh, and the, pro the, the really exciting thing about this opportunity is that unpaid internship was I got free CDs, which was like, for me, I don't need payment, just give me like free CDs. And the record labels would send them to you before they came out. So like I would, it was this just incredible thing to be listening to like a band I loved before it came out. That was like enough for me. I didn't need payment, I didn't need anything else. Um, but I really fell in love with journalism, started writing a lot about music, uh, kind of broadened that to write more about kind of like art and other topics. Um, and you know, kind of even went beyond that, started writing about kind of politics, civic issues, environment, and then fell really heavily into writing about food. I was kind of a hardcore food writer for uh, five or six years uh, for a variety of publications, um, but ended up at Sarasota Magazine, which is kind of where I'm the editor-in-chief today, um, and I've been there for about seven years. Um, and one thing I really love about Sarasota Magazine is, um, yeah, my main beat was food, I was writing about restaurants and kind of like fun stuff to do around town. You know, kind of light, great, wonderful, cool stories. Um, you know, entertaining, engaging, fun. But one thing I love about the magazine is they've always allowed, I think, the people who work there an opportunity to spend time on projects that kind of mean a little bit more to them. Um, and, you know, shockingly writing about like the cool new restaurant every week, like that's fun. But, you know, I think, you know, You've, a lot of people feel kind of called to like sort of do different work than that. And so one thing I love about the magazine is the opportunity to actually do that and throw yourself into these projects. So the stuff I'm going to read tonight, I'm actually um, going to start off kind of reading a story that I wrote in 2017. Um, Ryan asked me to read something kind of from Magazine World, and this was like the first story I thought of. Um, it was extremely meaningful to me. Um, I just started reading a lot about the challenges that people were facing uh, after being incarcerated. Um, and the ways that, you know, people kind of being released from prison or jail come home and the total lack of support or opportunities for many of these people um, who then are often kind of turn around and kind of end up committing more crimes and ending back in the same place that they just came from. Um, I don't know kind of where this idea came from, but it was something I was just really interested in exploring. And I spent, I mean, literally probably like a year working on a feature um, that kind of tackled this topic. Um, and not like a year where I'm working on it every single day, but it's the kind of story where I was like chipping away on it a little bit. Um, and the story ended up coming out in 2017. Uh, it's called Road to Redemption. Um, and what really like unlocked it for me, and I think what you know is really appealing to me about journalism in general, magazine writing specifically, is the opportunity to meet people, to interview them, to ask them about you know kind of like their highest highs and their lowest lows, and um, have people open up their lives to you and trust you with that story. I mean, that's just an incredible feeling, you know. And when you feel like you've done it well and you spent the time uh, to get it right, um, I think that that's a great feeling. Um, and that happened with this story. There's a young man I met named Sal D'Angelo who uh, was you know at that point had been out of prison and kind of had successfully kind of rebuilt his life. Um, several years earlier, um, but it took, it was a long path to get there. And so I'm going to read from the story. I'm just going to read like the beginning of it because it's very long, like about 5,000 words. 
I uh, just want to read the lead and kind of talk about, um, talks about Sal's life a little bit and kind of how he grew up and it just kind of gets you into the story. Um, and, uh, you know, anyways, something, probably the story that I'm probably most proud of in my career. Um, it's called Road to Redemption. It was February 1st, 2002, and Sal D'Angelo wanted to hide. D'Angelo, a wiry, five feet, 10 inches tall, 21-year-old with tattoos of a cross on his right leg and a wizard on his right arm, had just been released after 16 months in Lancaster Correctional Institute in Trenton, Florida, and another year in a Hillsborough County jail. His mother had picked him up and brought him to her home in Tampa, but instead of being elated, he was terrified. I didn't want to get out of the house, he says. I was scared to go back into society. Lancaster had been a nightmare, he says, a gladiator camp where brawls broke out between squads of prisoners segregated according to their hometowns. And the violence wasn't limited to the prisoners. On the bus to prison, a guard cracked D'Angelo in the face for sticking the tip of his toe into the aisle. By age 13, D'Angelo was already what he calls a full-blown addict. He was born in far Rockaway, New York, a rough section of Queens that was home to gangs divided along racial lines. D'Angelo's father was an alcoholic. His mother was addicted to crack cocaine. As a teenager, D'Angelo used cocaine, PCP, angel dust, and ecstasy. I took a super nosedive right into the streets, he says. There was nowhere else to go. He says drugs also helped him kill the shame of sexual abuse. When D'Angelo was 10, an older cousin began molesting him, and he had no one to turn to. D'Angelo's mother had moved to Tampa and left him with his father, who drank all day in his auto repair shop and brought D'Angelo with him to bars. D'Angelo served as a beer boy, fetching drinks for his father and his pals and munching on the cocktail fruit in the trays behind the bar. His father eventually got sober, but when D'Angelo began stealing to buy drugs, his father sent him to live with his mother. In Tampa, D'Angelo's habit grew worse. Stealing bikes from back porches and golf clubs from garages led to more serious crimes. On November 16, 1999, D'Angelo was behind the wheel of a red Ford probe when a friend reached out and snatched a purse from a woman in a Walmart parking lot. D'Angelo accelerated and the pair escaped with $448 in cash and goods. Twelve days later, they repeated the crime, this time in a Publix parking lot, making off with $230. Arrested two weeks later, D'Angelo was charged with strong-arm robbery, burglary, grand theft, and dealing in stolen property. He went to prison the next year. After he was released, he says, I wanted to do good. I wanted to be a good person. But he didn't have the courage or the guidance to cut ties with old friends. He hadn't told his buddies he was coming home, but they heard the news. And when they came around a week later, they wanted to celebrate, which meant getting drunk and getting high. D'Angelo made it five months before being arrested again. So that's the lead of the story. And then kind of you know, from this super tight story kind of zooms out to like a bigger picture look at kind of incarceration um, in the U.S. and more specifically in Florida, um, you know, where 47 percent of the prisoners are behind bars um, for the second time or even kind of more times than that. Um, anyways, long story. There's a lot of stats in there, so I'm not going to read the whole thing tonight. Um, but, you know, uh, something I'm super proud of. And, um, you know, if you're interested in reading the rest of it, let me know and I can share the link with you. Um, the other thing kind of Ryan asked me to read tonight was a novel. Um, actually, just about a year ago, um, I published my first novel. It's called Dead Fish Wind. Um, fiction had always been something that I was interested in while doing journalism. In fact, um, when I was really young starting out, I really wanted to do fiction writing exclusively and kind of fell into journalism as more of a way to kind of write for a living um, and really fell in love with that as well. But I always had this burning desire to still do fiction. Um, and in 2012, um, <laughs> I lost my job. Uh, I got laid off from a news site that I was working for. I was like, heck, I'm going to go back to school. I've always wanted to do fiction. I've always wanted to do creative writing, so I'm going to throw myself into this. Spent a couple years getting my MFA. Um, and while I was there, that was kind of like where the genesis of the novel started. Um, I know um, sometimes, like in my class now, I know we do these in-class writing assignments. Maybe perhaps they seem, you know, not the, like, uh, like super engaging, but they can be extremely powerful, these writing assignments. Um, when the ge whole genesis of my novel came from an assignment that I had in class, uh, and the assignment was to um, close your eyes, get a fresh sheet of paper, uh, pen, you got three minutes, and you have to write, and, but you can't stop writing. Like, you ha your hand has to keep moving. Um, the whole idea being, get out of your head, 
Just let kind of what's in your mind come out onto the page. Don't stop. Don't second guess what you're doing. Uh, get out of your own way, basically. And you know, when the teacher kind of hit the timer, uh, I closed my eyes and I had this image of um, a woman walking home. She's wearing like a heavy coat, and there's kind of this huge wind like blasting her. Um, and she kind of is struggling against it. She comes into a house, and there's like her father is sitting in a chair smoking a cigar or a pipe. Um, that was it. That was all I was able to get in like the three minutes, right? Um, but my professor at the time, she told me, she's like, well, that's the best thing you've written in this class. And I was like, uh, okay, well, it's a little insulting, <laughs> but, you know, whatever, I'll take it. Um, but, and I, you know, I kind of I saw what she meant, you know, and uh, so I just decided to give it a chance and run with it. Um, and the whole story kind of like flowed from that like one moment. Um, and it took a long time. I started writing it in 2013. The book came out last year, so you can imagine the kind of process it takes of writing, revising, submitting, all that stuff, the kind of that we, we're talking about all the time about getting better as writers. Um, you know, one thing I would say is like time, I think it paid off. Uh, you know, the book, if it had come out five years ago, wouldn't have been as good, you know? And every time I read it, every time I worked on it, every time I cut a little paragraph or a couple lines or whatever, it got better. And like you feel it getting better as you're looking at it and that keeps you excited and engaged. Um, so I'm going to kind of read a chapter from it. It's kind of early on in the, in the novel, um, the section I'm going to read. Um, the only thing you really need to know is that the main character, her name is Cicely, um, and she's caring for her father um, in kind of this like dystopian, twisted version of Sarasota um, that is being struck by kind of two like tandem crises. One is like this catastrophic red tide outbreak, and the other is this kind of really horrible like economic depression that's kind of been uh, like crushing the city for kind of quite a while. Um, so Cicely and her father kind of live on the margins um, of this town where, you know, there's this very stratified wealthy elite and kind of a large uh, population of people who are struggling. Um, so I think that that's all you really need to know to set up this chapter. So it's Cicely and her father are the main characters. Cicely didn't work on Tuesdays, so she and her father had made a habit of walking together to the field just south of downtown where volunteers from St. Mark's Church showed a sermon and served lunch to the poor each week. Cicely put on her only dress, a pale yellow A-line with pockets, and her father wore the checkered gray shirt and red tie she washed for him each week. Everyone else tried to dress up for the event too, and if you stood far enough away from the crowd, you might mistake the gathering for just another ice cream social. But up close, the details revealed need. Tan pants with holes in back pockets, mismatched buttons on threadbare suits, shoes with flapping soles. The field itself sloped down toward a high stage where the St. Mark's parishioners had erected a massive screen that seemed too bright even in the middle of the day. The liver-spotted face of Father Bill loomed over the crowd, and speakers carried his sibilant recitations to the furthest edges of the grass, where stood porta potties emblazoned with the church's seal. The crowd had grown so large in recent years that the police began stopping traffic on the road that curved around the property. The audience on this Tuesday looked even bigger than usual. Cicely guessed it was because the fish had everyone spooked. So that's a reference to the red tide. There's tons of dead fish washing up on the beach, of course. Give first so that it may be given to us, Father Bill was saying. Now what do I mean by that? Rumors that Father Bill wasn't even local had been circulating for years. No one Cicely knew had ever seen him in the flesh. Give what, Father Bill asked, in these times of woe, when we're all struggling mightily simply to live with dignity, what more can we give? Standing beside her father on the outskirts of the crowd, Cicely couldn't help thinking that he looked handsome and that it was because of her. Early in the morning, she set the washing bucket out in the sun to warm the water so she could lather his face with soap and shave him. You could see small nicks if you knew to look for them, but she had done the best she could. He appeared decent. His face was pale where his whiskers had been, a contrast with his red cheeks and the scalp touched pink by the sun that was visible through his thin, wintry hair. He was just as drawn into himself in public as he was at home, but here his posture straightened and he held his head up. The coldness she saw in his eyes the night she kicked his chair had vaporized, leaving his face bemused. He stood listening to Father Bill with his hands clasped behind his back, chewing his lower lip and listening respectfully. Did he believe in God? He was raised Episcopal, but he had never mentioned the Lord's name in her presence, except to curse. But listen to Luke 6.38, and when I say listen, I mean it, listen. 
Father Bill emphasized each syllable. Give, and it shall be given unto you. Do you hear that? Do you feel the power of those words, the truth? A good portion will fall into your lap. The portion you give will determine the portion you receive in return. A small cheer went up from the most fervent believers, those who clustered near the screen. Up close, so big, Father Bill's face must have looked like the face of God. Cicely noticed that someone had vandalized the enormous banner that hung above the screen. It now read, St. Mark's, like with an X. Sounds good, doesn't it? Father Bill paused. Sounds good to me. It sounds very good, very good. And this promise that God has made, that whatever you give will be repaid to you, is no idle promise. Nothing like those promises we keep hearing from Washington, D.C., scattered booze. No, 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 God never makes a promise he won't keep. I promise you that. Father Bill put on his pensive face. Now, before we join together in prayer to bless our meal, I'd like to read you another passage. This one from Mark, the book of Mark, Mark 11:24. Therefore, I say to you, whatever you pray and ask for, believe that you will receive it, and it will be so for you. Father Bill looked as if he were fighting back tears. Whatever you pray and ask for, it will be so. It will be so. It will be so. Shouts of hallelujah and amen rang out from the crowd. As Cicely bent a scratch at a small cluster of mosquito bites on her ankle, her stomach rumbled. From behind each side of the giant screen, St. Mark's volunteers, recognizable from their flowing red robes, walked down into the crowd bearing offering plates lined with red felt. The golden rims glimmered in the sun. Cicely's father spat on the ground. Papa? He turned to her. I hate accepting food from these people. It wouldn't stop him from eating, Cicely knew, but she tempered her annoyance. No worse than me taking food from work. Cicely watched as the teenage boy pulled the dollar bill from his new balances and placed it in one of the offering plates. A young, red-robed woman holding one of the golden discs started to walk towards Cicely and her father, but her father's sneer made the volunteer stop short. She turned back toward the condensed center of the audience. Once the offering had been collected, the volunteers pulled the tops off the chafing dishes lined up on office tables to the left of the screen. Cicely was starving, but didn't protest when her father cut in front of her in line. When no one was looking, she snatched a whole handful of plastic spoons from the napkin-lined basket at the end of the buffet. You never knew. The food was always simple, beef stews, lentil soups, dry biscuits, but today's meal was the most basic yet, just a bowl of plain white unseasoned grits with a ladle of tomato sauce on top. There were no tables at which to eat, so Cicely and her father sat cross-legged in the grass, brown and crushed from so many feet trampling on it. The mosquito bites on Cicely's ankle required another vigorous scratch. Despite their simplicity, the Tuesday meals put most people in a good mood and Cicely enjoyed watching people mill about, eating and talking. She smiled at anyone who looked her in the eye. She would have liked to start a conversation with someone, but no one ever came close enough. Her father slurped up his food as quickly as possible so he could get back in line before the others. In his haste, a drop of maroon tomato sauce dripped from his spoon and onto his tan pants. He didn't even notice. He had looked handsome to Cicely before. Now he looked like an animal again, an ape. Was this what her mother had seen before she left? The few photos Cicely had seen of her father when he was young made him look almost refined. In one, he stood next to five or six guys in gray boiler suits at the factory, but he himself was dressed in blue jeans and a spotless bright white v-neck t-shirt, the cuffs of his pants rolled up above shiny black loafers. The men in boiler suits glared at the camera with hatred. Cicely's father beamed. As lunch wound down, all those gathered in the field began talking about the piles of dead fish. Everyone had a theory. Tallahassee was behind it, punishing the city because the governor was feuding with the mayor. Or it must be leftover residue from one of last year's oil spills, seeping up out of the Gulf floor and killing the fish. Or it had to be related to that golf course they were rehabbing out east, the one they were using all the orange chemicals on. And what was up with all those helicopters buzzing the other day? Was that related to the catastrophe? No one in the crowd knew anything. Cicely herself hadn't been down to the beach since that first day, but the stench had hung around, strengthening and weakening, depending on the tides and the direction of the wind. I wonder what Father Bill makes of all the dead fish, she said to her father. He snorted into his second helping of grits. You of all people. I was joking, Papa. He looked up. Right. Papa, I really do need you to go to the VFW tomorrow. We need help with the rent. She shooed flies away from her bowl, even though she had finished eating. Really? Can you do that? He stood up, stretched his arms up high. Sweat had seeped through the armpits of his shirt. He crumpled his plastic bowl in half. I'll think about it. The crowd was beginning to break apart, some slogging back onto the road, back north, toward the bus depot, 
while others walked east to catch the buses that would take them out near the interstate. The St. Mark's volunteers, their red robes now heavy and damp with perspiration, began hosing out the chafing dishes. They lowered a plastic sheet over the screen to protect it from rain. Cicely threw her bowl in the green dumpster next to the toilets. She scratched her ankle for a third time. Her fingertips came up bloody. Thank you very much. All right, let's, let's sit down and have a conversation and we'll bring people into it. Let's do it. Uh, right here. <laughs> you did a great job of framing things and giving a lot of biographical stuff. That's why I didn't give any up front because I knew it would come up. Mm -hmm. uh, let's, let's start by talking about your connection to Florida. So you're not a native Floridian. Most people aren't, I realize, right? No, it's true. Yeah, so I was born in Portland, Oregon um, and lived there until I was about 12. Spent a couple years in Cincinnati, Ohio, and then I moved here when I was 15. So I went to high school here in Sarasota. Went away to college and then came back in 2003. So I've been back for about 20 years since here in Sarasota. So. so something that I noticed, and I've seen a lot of the student questions as they've done research and preparation of this too, mm -hmm. and a lot of people are curious. It seems like you have a deep connection to Florida, like it really informs your work, both your magazine writing, which I wanted people to hear a little bit of, mm -hmm. as well as your fiction. Can you talk about your relationship to that and how it informs your work? Yeah, well, I think, um, I mean, <laughs> I kind of lucked out in a sense because there's, perennial interest in like weird Florida, right? Um, and so like, this is like a vein like I was interested in for many years and then I feel like the rest of the world maybe like came around to it. Um, but yeah, I think like, um, I would say like one thing that um, I felt when I was younger when I moved here was it was hard for me to make a connection to the natural world around here. Um, you know, growing up in Oregon, I thought of like camping as like on you know, mountains and streams and all that, fly fishing and all this other stuff. And then you come to Florida and it's like the beach and kind of different things. It was hard for me to make a connection with that. Um, but I would say like when, um, when my wife and I were young, like 25, 26, we often would go out camping at Mayaka River State Park. Um, and just, I will say that absolutely kind of transformed like my feelings about Florida's landscape. And there was like this real richness and like um, beauty there that I had absolutely like missed when I was younger, you know? Um, and so I think just spending time in nature, like absolutely kind of, changed my opinion of Florida. Um, and then, you know, I think too, I would say like in terms of journalism, obviously like I've been a local journalist, so I've been pretty exclusively focused on writing about Sarasota and Florida stuff my entire career. And one thing that's kind of interesting is how that like intermingles with fiction, right? Um, you know, nothing in the book is really like exactly like ripped from like my journalism career or anything, but I knew a lot about Red Tide because I had written a story about Red Tide in like 2006, seven, there was a really bad outbreak back then. And so I always had in the back of my mind, like there's something more to Red Tide as a topic or a theme or like an, an ambiance, you know? Um, and so that's kind of one way I think like journalism and fiction have like overlapped, you know? It's not like a one-to-one -one relationship between the two, but it's definitely played a role. It's just given me exposure to things around here that then inspire my fiction. Yeah. So when people say, write what you know, you know all sorts of things because you have to do it for your other job. Yeah. It gives you fodder. Yeah, exactly. And write what you know doesn't have to be, you know, like your own life, right? It's like what you hear from other people, you know? I mean, you can kind of steal stories from, from everywhere, right? So I would say like absolutely like it informs it, not in like an autobiographical sense, but just an experience sense for sure. So you've got these two identities, Cooper, <laughs> novelist, Cooper, magazine guy. Mm -hmm. Clearly things are different in how you operate in those spheres. For one thing, if it took you seven years to write the novel, it took you seven years to write the articles, you have a problem. Yes. So like, yeah. Can you talk about kind of the process of how you approach story, sort of different things and how they intersect and also differ? Yeah, well, um, deadlines are a good thing, you know. <laughs> like, I think that in journalism, you know, you know, like with a magazine, right, on February 17th, we're like uploading a giant PDF of the, you know, all the pages of our magazine for the March issue. If it's not ready then, then pff, it's not gonna end up in your mailbox, right? So it's like there are these very hard deadlines just to literally produce the product that like ends up out there. Um, and deadlines I find actually can be uh, uh, create, like they generate creativity, you know? Like it forces you to sit down and really think and buckle down and focus on what you're doing. Um, I think that a lot of the challenge that I faced when I was younger and trying to do both fiction and journalism was fiction was like the optional thing I was doing like on the side 
and there wasn't a lot of pressure to do it. Nobody wanted me to do it. Like, you know what I mean? Like, there was, there was like nobody like in my ear telling me, man, you should really write a book. It was just like all for myself, you know? If anything, people were telling me not to do it. So I was feeling like it was this optional thing that I just never really devoted myself to. I will say that was one thing that was really different for me about when I went back to school and got my MFA was you start having deadlines, you know, and you, you're accountable to somebody else. Um, you're working with a mentor who's spending their time trying to help you get better, you know, and like, so there's a, you know, you're trying to like actually accomplish something um, that's outside of your own head. So um, I would say that's a big difference. Um, but also too, I think fiction, again, I just, um, you know, I go back to that moment in that class when like the idea for this, this story kind of first came to me is, you know, I feel like fiction is very much like tapping into that like pool of like unconscious creativity that's within you. And that's very different for me from thinking about a story. You know, it's like the story kind of just comes out of you in a way. And then you have to work on it and shape it and revise it and do all those things like later on. Um, whereas with, with magazine journalism, you know, or journalism in general, like there are certain formats. We're talking about this in my class, right? There's like a Q&A format. There's a, a way that people write profiles. There's a way that people write reviews. And you can break those rules. I mean, there's nothing kind of ironclad about them. But you kind of know this is going to be a thousand words, right? You can't, you know, make it ten thousand just because you think the writing is great, you know. Um, so yeah, very different, but um, they bleed into each other for sure. So talk a little bit about your career and how it's developed in the the day job. Uh -huh. So you started off sort of as a you know freelancer and work with news organizations. Now you're in management. Mm -hmm. What new appreciations do you have for the industry from this new perspective as opposed to when you were on the other side? scrambling for opportunities and, you know, making it happen. Yeah, well, I'd say, I mean, one of them is kind of what I mentioned earlier about, like, getting it out. Like, honestly, just completing the magazine <laughs> and getting it out. And all the moving parts that go into it is pretty astonishing. Like, when I was a freelancer, I mean, typically, you know, when you're a freelancer, you write the story, you submit it, maybe the editor kind of asks for feedback or rewrites or something, and you're kind of going back and forth, and forth until the story's finished. But once you're done with the story, um, you know, I'm like, all right, on to the next one, right? And so, and then like a couple months later, it shows up in, in the mailbox. Um, what I don't see, what you don't see as a freelancer is how it gets from like a Word document to like a really nicely like laid out page, you know? Um, and so that means everything from um, hiring photographers, um, you know, giving the photographers direction, like they have to understand the story because they're gonna go out and shoot it and they wanna capture an image that really matches the story. If they're hiring an illustrator, you know, they have to find the illustrator, you know, like, which we have a lot of talented ones we work with regularly, but you never know. Maybe you want to try somebody new this time. Um, you know, page count, like literally the size of our magazines gets smaller or bigger depending on uh, how many ads the salespeople are selling. So some like last issue, somebody comes to you and is like, hey, we've got six extra pages in the magazine. Can you fill them? I was like, okay, <laughs> you know, like I guess so, you know. Um, so it definitely gives me much more of an appreciation for you know, again, how it goes from being a Word document to being something that somebody would actually like pay seven ninety five for, for sure. You know, and like that was I had zero insight into that process before. So yeah. So I tell students all the time that they're all experts in lots of things, and what we teach here, whether you're creative writing majors or minors, you just take writing classes occasionally. We teach you how to communicate. If you can communicate your expertise, you could theoretically write for magazines and newspapers. What's one of the uh, common mistakes that people make when they're starting off and they realize this and they start submitting to, you know, a hobby magazine or an art magazine or a newspaper. What do you, what do you see? What can you recommend to help them out, give them a leg up towards reaching that success if they decide to go that route? Yeah, well, I would say number one is like read, read the publication. Like if you really want to write for a publication, you should be like a reader of it, you know. Um, you know, you can't just Google a publication and say, wow, this one looks cool. Like I'm going to submit something, right? So be a fan, know the publication. Um, you know, not saying you have to have, you know, read 10 years worth of issues before you can submit to them, but like know something about them. Um, and think about, and we just did this in class last week, but think about the audience, right? So, um, you know, like what we were looking at different like cooking magazines and some of them are really weighted towards like, um, you know, kind of home cooks. Some of them focus more on restaurant stuff. Um, you know, so know kind of who you're pitching and, and who you're talking to. Um, and and also understand their rhythm, right? Is this a publication that comes out every week? Is it every month? Is it a website, right, that's daily? Um, you know, I think um, knowing the publication's rhythm and when they would want a story. So if you want to write a story about, 
uh, music festival that's coming up, people want to read about the music festival before they buy tickets for it, right? So think about when you want the article to come out and pitch them with enough lead time so that the article can actually give people information before the event occurs. Um, that's a common thing I see a lot is, is, is people want to write something that, about something that happened last week. It might be interesting, but you know, like it happened last week. I, I, I can't go to it anymore, you know? Um, so I would say all those things are, are really important. Um, and, um, and also, I would also encourage you to like try to develop relationships. Um, you know, I can't tell you how many times like I have a story idea and I know a specific freelancer who like, that's the person who's right for the story, you know? And it's because they've worked on something similar before. Um, it's because I've seen them work on a, a similar topic somewhere else. And I can trust that they're gonna turn it in. They're gonna write kind of what I ask them to. They're gonna hit the deadline. And once you have that relationship, it, I feel like it just opens up so many doors, you know? And people hear about that. Like, if you're a good freelancer, your name will get around, you know? <laughs> like, other publications will start being like, hey, what's it like to work for this person, you know? And like, you build a good reputation for yourself. So, so you're talking about building the professional brand. Yes, absolutely, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it really is like you need to think about like every aspect of that when you're communicating with somebody is kind of like, you know, you're representing yourself at all times, you know, even in a mundane email that you might be sending to somebody. So, so how much do you get to write these days now that you're in management versus the other? Because I think we imagine you sit down and you write like 80% of the thing and you're just always, but that's not it. No, no, I mean, I, it's, gosh, I mean, I've, I don't know, the last few months I've probably written like two or three articles maybe, if that even, you know, um, you know, editing is, I really love editing a lot, um, and I really enjoy it, uh, particularly kind of like working with our staff, our freelancers who are extremely talented, and they care a lot. You know, it's really great to work with people who care a lot. Um, so I spend a lot of my time helping other writers kind of get to where they want to go, uh, rather than my own. And, you know, it's, it's, there's positives and negatives to that. There's times when I miss getting a chance to get out and meet people and do interviews and stuff, and so that part of it does kind of stink sometimes. But that's just the way it is, you know, and um, so that's kind of where I'm at right now. I have one last question, then we're going to move it to the audience, and Sylvia's going to help us with the microphone, so just wave, and she'll come around in a minute here. I'm always curious about people's process. Could you talk a bit about your actual writing process? Like, literally, what does it look like? Do you have time of day? Do you have a lucky pen? And how, how, how does revision, where does that kind of come into play as well, too? Yeah, I would say I, I kind of, I, how would I describe this? I used to be really obsessed with process, and I realized that I was actually like creating barriers because I just didn't want to do the work, you know? And so I had this idea that like, I had to sit down in a certain spot, I had to use a manual typewriter and like then type it into Word or whatever. Like I had this just absurd idea about like kind of the right way that you're supposed to be a writer. Um, and I realized at a certain point, like I was just doing that to like avoid actually sitting down and doing the work, you know? I was creating obstacles for myself. Um, and so, my process is extremely simple. I use pages, you know, the generic one that's on Apple computers. Um, you know, my, I will say like, I, I kind of mentioned that before, like the kind of the difference between fiction and journalism. Like when I'm writing my best fiction, I'm not thinking about it. It's really like just kind of like, I'm, I'm just going. And I think first drafts in general, like I think should be really messy and kind of Frankly, they don't make a lot of sense. And there's like, wh who's this character, right? Like, no, I thought it was his uncle. No, he's his dad, whatever. Like, oh, you know, you kind of have all these like problems that you have to solve. But I think like when you're doing, when I'm doing a first draft, I cannot care about any of that stuff. It's really just about kind of like getting the story out and then um, revising. So I always think about that as kind of like that impulsive, like I'm just kind of going with the flow kind of attitude. Um, but then, you know, when you're revising, that's when I come back and I'm kind of like imposing order on it. And I'm thinking about things like, does this make sense? Like, you know, do, you know, do we really need, you know, this obscure little tangent that I went on because I was having fun with it, you know? And that's where you can just like cut and refine and get better. And that's, I think, where you're using your brain more, like you're using your intellect c to try to kind of actually like focus this energy. Um, and so that's always been kind of what works for me. And I find if I'm sitting down and I'm really like thinking hard about what I'm writing, then it's not very creative, you know? And it's like, I'm trying to solve a problem. I'm not really feeling very inspired. So I know that I'm probably not doing my best work. And that happens, right? You have good days and bad days, it happens. 
and you just kind of like got to grind through those, I guess I would say. But you, but you keep going, even though you know it's going to take extra revision later. Exactly. I mean, revision, you know, your first draft, you don't have to show that to anybody. You know what I mean? It's like just <laughs> like that's for you, you know, and like nobody's ever going to care about your first draft. You know what I mean? It's like they're unless, you know, I don't know, a hundred years later, some scholars looking at your stuff. But it's like, um, you know, first drafts, I think, should be kind of a wreck, you know, and then they get better over time as you work on them. So, yeah. And I would say too, reiterate what I said earlier, like you read it five times, 10 times, 15 times, like it gets better every time you revise it, seriously, and you'll see that it gets better for sure, you know. Love it. Okay, we're gonna open things up to the audience. Uh, I know most of you have questions already, but uh, we're gonna let you raise your hands and start with stuff. Many hands, let's go to Nick right here. So, um, thanks. Initially, you talked about a story you wrote about redemption, or it was a piece you did, uh -huh. and about how uh, criminals, they don't have a lot of uh, support after their release, mm -hmm. um, and a lot of this discouragement can, uh, can sort of keep them in the same paths. Mm -hmm. um, so I have a, an interesting question. Do you think that there are, um, there's ever a line of where to have empathy for like what particular crime, like um, what people can be helped and what people can't. Do you find that there's ever a line um, that you talk about in that? Oh, I mean, I think in that, you know, that's I think for every person really like needs to make that decision you know, like where that line is. I mean, I absolutely, I think that there's a line, you know, like I, I couldn't define that for you right now, but I think so, you know. Um, I think what I was trying to do with that article was approach it more from, is this good policy? Um, because, you know, so if, if recidivism is huge, right? So pe most people who come out of prison end up back in it, right? That's creating more victims. So I guess the question is kind of whether that's actually like a good public policy um, to be as harsh and as punitive for people who are coming out. And you know, I think there's there's definitely like nuances to that. And obviously, like um, there's a lot of debate around that. Um, but I was trying to a, a, a approach the topic more from like public policy rather than empathy. I guess I would say you know it's not about like feeling necessarily one way or the other. It's about what's the best way to keep to keep crime low, to be honest with you. You know, like how do we actually prevent fewer future crimes and future victims? But thanks for the question. If you want to read the story, I'll send you a link later. Here we go. Logan. Hello. Um, I was curious, what were the first steps you took to publish your novel? I'm, I have one that I'm getting very close to finishing the first drafts on. Uh -huh. And I know I need to do redrafting, but I don't, I've talked to my professors, but I don't fully know where to start with the- You're talking about like submitting it? Like actually yeah, submitting, it searching out. for people, because I don't really want to self-publish, I want to try to traditionally publish, because mm -hmm. um, I think that's a better move for like reach yeah. and just experience in general. So yeah. I'm wondering how you started. Sure, yeah. Um, uh, I don't know if I have the, the best, <laughs> advice because it took years. So I don't know if this is exactly the best way to go about it. I started, so I started writing in 2013. I had a first draft, again, terribly messy, like a year later, and then spent a few years working on it. 2018, I felt I kind of, okay, I'm gonna start, you know, felt kind of confident. I was gonna start sending this out. Um, and I started with um, agents. So, you know, I, the typical advice I always write is to try to find you know, if you have a certain niche of book, you know, um, try to find agents who specialize in that niche. Um, I looked a lot at like uh, Florida writers, um, you know, uh, there's kind of like this, you know, with the red tide, there's kind of like this, this environmental angle. So I was looking at like environmental um, climate fiction is kind of like a phrase that gets thrown around a lot. So I was looking at agents who represented those kinds of writers uh, and pitched them um, and did the old thing too of like finding writers I liked and like who are their agents, you know. Um, you know, and then I kept a Google spreadsheet that I updated with every rejection, you know, which reached, <laughs> got to the point about like 90 rejections or so. And so I tried agents first, didn't really have a lot of success with that. And then I started looking, so my next step after that was looking at small publishers that I could submit to directly. Um, and again, I focused mostly on um, you know, there's some small presses that focus on like environmental topics, for example. 
um, you know, you just try to find books that seem, I mean, I hate to say like vibes, right? But that you kind of like vibe with, you know what I mean? And it's like, so I think um, that was kind of my process. And eventually like through small presses was able to find one um, that's based in Texas that accepted it. Um, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it's long road, you know? And it's like, you gotta be used to rejection and just kind of keep going on, you know? But seriously, I, I submitted it at least a hundred times before somebody said yes, so. Oh, sorry, I'm sorry. Um, I get so excited when I hear about Florida-centric stories that aren't just like realistic fiction. Um, and I was wondering, well, my question, <laughs> my first sort of like jokey intro question is, can we see the cover of your book? Oh, yeah. Um, and then my follow-up question is, how did you go about developing the environment your story takes place in? I know you mentioned that it's like heavily inspired by like the 2005-2006 Red Tide outbreak. Uh -huh. But like from there, how did you go to sort of like draft those characters and how they interact with the world? Yeah, well, I think like, so, I mean, it was like, here's the cover. <laughs> Being good pitch, pitch uh, product spokesman. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, I, I guess I'd always had it, um, you know, it's funny, so again, I'd written, there was this real bad outbreak in like 2006, six seven that I wrote about and kind of learned a lot about Red Tide. And I'd never experienced it before really, even being here in Florida. And when I started writing in 2013, we had not had a bad Red Tide outbreak for many years at that point. And I was like, oh man, I'm gonna knock people's socks off with this like Red Tide thing, right? Cause like nobody's heard of this. It's like unusual, like people aren't thinking about it. And then like literally like right as I'm finishing it up is like we had that really awful crisis if y'all were around in like 2017, 2018. Um, and at the time I was like, man, it'd be great to have a Red Tide book on the shelf like, you know, <laughs> that like people could buy right now. Um, but so it goes to show you like I was kind of thinking like this is this cool like under the radar thing, you know, that sort of um, few people, like not few people, but like a lot of people weren't really thinking about at the time. Um, and then it kind of became this thing, right? Um, and so I tried to kind of like lean into that a little bit like as I was revising it. And I think when I was um, writing like the jacket copy and when I was pitching writers or um, publishers and stuff like that, I was really trying to play up the timeliness of it. You know, that kind of helped me a little bit, I think. Well, maybe it did, I'm not sure, but I tried. Um, but yeah, so I, you know, for me, it was always like I, I, the joke I always tell people is like, I took everything I didn't like about Sarasota and I like cranked it up to 11, you know? And so like, it was like, it wasn't just like a bad red tide crisis, but it's like the worst red tide crisis ever, right? And like, I was just trying to make everything as kind of like heightened as possible. Um, and so that was kind of like my MO, right? And like, you know, at the same time, I'm heightening these things that, you know, are unpleasant about Sarasota. And I just minimized, you know, there's no nice scene where they go out camping in my Acker River State Park. You know what I mean? It's like, it's, it really plays up the kind of like ugliness or whatever, you know? Um, and so I was, it, so that was kind of like the philosophy I took was just sort of like, um, you know, trying to build a world that, you know, is kind of dystopian, but I didn't want it to be dystopian in the kind of, you know, robots have taken over kind of way, you know what I mean? So I was trying to make it a realistic dystopia, I guess, you know. Like. Hi, so um, my question kind of ties into both the publication of your book and your career in writing articles. Did you ever find an opportunity, like with your network of like article writing to advertise your own book? Um, you mean like uh, market it? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so well, um, yeah, it was kind of awkward because, you know, a colleague of mine at the magazine, Megan McDonald, um, she's one of our editors. She's like, oh, we're doing a story on your book. And I was like, I didn't want to push it. I didn't want to like twist anybody's arm and feel like I was kind of like making someone like write about me, you know? Um, but she did me a solid for sure. And she wanted to do like a Q and A and like write about it, uh, which I think was tremendously helpful and kind of like just um, getting the word out at first for sure. Um, and you know, it kind of played into a little bit of like, obviously like our magazine's readership, like people know me, things like that, right? Um, but it, it's, it's a weird thing where it's like, um, you know, you don't wanna be seen as like taking advantage of that, right? And so it's always like this awkward dance, I feel like, you know, kind of between like wanting publicity, but also like not feeling like you're twisting somebody's arm. Um, but I would say the other thing I, you know, that that helped with was, I think it also just caught the eye of other people who might want to write about it. So I had a couple other people who did interviews and kind of wrote stories about it. Um, so it just helped kind of get it out in front of like more people's eyes. Um, you know, self-promotion is really difficult. And I was working with a small press 
you know, they put out some stuff about it, but it's not like they have a big advertising budget, right? So a lot of the promotion like fell to me, which is, um, I mean, to be honest with you, is hard. You know, I, I, there's, it's, I think as writers, like, um, you know, bragging about ourselves is like not typically what we do, <laughs> you know? I mean, there are exceptions for sure, but most writers are now, that's not like their strong suit, you know? Um, and I know many people who, uh, you know, have hired people just to help even with social media and stuff like that too. I mean, I just didn't have that kind of like the budget for that at the time, you know, but yeah. Does that answer your question? Yes, yeah. thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi. Um, so you mentioned before uh, when you're writing you'll often do a bunch of different revisions on your work uh, before it gets published. Um, but my question is, when you're writing that first draft, do you ever get to a point where you're just like stuck and you don't really know like where to go from where you are and if you have any advice on kind of how to get out of that phase and into a better mindset? No, I've never been stuck in my writing. I always just have great ideas that just flow out of me, you know, no, like I've, totally. I mean, everybody always has that experience, right? And I would say, I mean, there's a couple things I would, I would recommend. One is um, get your characters like out of their normal routine in any way possible. Um, and that could be as simple as like getting them on a plane, you know, they've got to take a trip, so they've got to go to a funeral across the country, right? Kind of gets them out into like a different environment. You have them interacting with, in different ways with different people. Um, find excuses to like just have your characters do things that, you know, maybe they haven't done yet. Um, another tip I would say too is like sometimes if you have, particularly if a, if a, a story has multiple characters, but say like, you know, it's like two of them haven't really like spent time together, Try to find a way to like bump in, bump two characters like who haven't interacted together a lot, you know, like have them like spend time together and whatever, you can kind of find a contrived way to like make that happen. Uh, you know, like um, car breaks down and you need a ride and then you have this conversation, right? Um, and so just anything you can do to kind of like break the routine of your story, I think is really powerful. Um, and also too, I mean, I think, um, you know, like you have your main story, right? I mean, about, uh, I, I don't know like what kind of stuff you write, but it's like your main story might be uh, an adventure story or something. But like, what's that person's job, right? Maybe they like lose their job. Maybe they have to go on a work trip. Maybe they were going to a conference, you know? Like there's all these different things of like, um, and all the multifaceted way that we are people that like you can find a way to get them out of their routine, I would say, so. So you were talking about how with the small publishers that uh, you had to do a lot of the marketing basically yourself. Um, giving that experience, would uh, publishing yourself, like doing a Kickstarter or something like that, would that be something that you would consider in the future with how much effort you probably had to spend already doing that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I would consider it for sure. The thing with like Kickstarter, right, is you almost have to have like an already existing fan base or audience, right, um, that you're kind of playing into. So if you have something like that, um, then I think you can like leverage that and kind of be successful. And, you know, um, depends what type of book you're writing. Like if you're, um, uh, like, I'm just totally random, but say you're like a fitness influencer, right? And you wanna write a book, like, but you've got all these followers on social media or something like that. Um, then you can maybe get your fans to support this effort to like build a book, but you've already got this existing like audience, you know what I mean? Kind of that you know kind of wants this book. Um, so if you have that, that could be like a great option, but I think trying to generate interest with, um, unless you have that kind of built-in fandom, I think can be extremely difficult for like a Kickstarter. Um, Self-publishing, you know, like I, I know people who have done it and, you know, kind of like, it's, it's like a grind. You have to be prepared to like, you know, reach out to hundreds of publications, you know, like do all the kind of events that you possibly can, um, you know, and some people have success with it. Um, but it's a lot of work for sure. So it, it's like if you're, and you have to be good at self-promotion. I think that's the other thing too I've, I've kind of learned about myself is like that's not a strong suit. So I don't know if that's the path I would go, but um, you know, I think if, if you're naturally better at that than I am, then <laughs> it could be a solution for sure. Hi, uh, my question is actually a follow-up to something that you said earlier about four or five answers ago, which is when you referred to uh, the long list of rejections <laughs> the one uh, might face yeah. <laughs> or will face. Yes. Uh, and, and my question is, how do you know, how does a, a new writer especially know how to differentiate between, well, you know, uh, 
keep trying because 101st time's a charm. Mm -hmm. uh, or once your rejections get into the triple digit territory, how do you know? Well, perhaps what I thought was my finished product that's ready to go isn't ready. Yeah. Uh, and, and how do you uh, know with confidence and certainty Maybe that's a loaded question. <laughs> that you're actually ready, or that you maybe need to come back and try again, revising. Yeah, yeah I mean, it's such a hard question, you know. Um, you know, because you don't want to just keep banging your head against the wall, right, for 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 years and feeling frustrated. Um, one thing I would suggest, um, well, I guess a couple things. One is, you know, you start off on this road, you get right away, like you start getting the form rejections, right? Where it's just like, nope, <laughs> you know? And like, you know, nobody even like took the time to write you, no even know your name, right? And you just got this, the standard rejection. You get a lot of those. And then eventually you get like the nice rejection, you know, which is like, hey, we really like this, but you know what I mean? And then kind of illuminates why they don't like it. But it's like, you know, you're, you're kind of, you're, you know the person spent some time with it. They had some thoughtfulness about it. And it might sound crazy, but sometimes there's like thoughtful rejections. I mean, that's like a little juice to like keep you going, right? And because you know, like maybe there's something here, you know? So I would say if you're, if you're getting to like 100 and you're still getting just like straight, straight like the, the blanket nose, you know what I mean? I mean, maybe that's a time to, to think about kind of moving on to something else. Um, but even then, you know, it's like, I mean, What's, what's one more email? I would tell myself that all the time, right? What's one more email to send? You know, the worst thing they can say is no, you know? <laughs> um, but the other thing, I, the other advice I would have is, you know, if you're frustrated with that, if you're experiencing that, um, you start writing something else, you know? You don't have to like abandon that project. Just because you're writing a new thing, that doesn't mean that you're throwing the old thing in the trash, you know? Um, and you can, you know, keep working on submitting it and revising it while working on a new project as well, you know? So you can try to find a way to take out your angst on uh, some new, pro <laughs> new project. But it's, I, I mean, I joke about it and like, we can be lighthearted about it, but I mean, it's tough, you know, I understand, so, yeah. We got time for one or two last questions. So if you have anything you need to ask Cooper, this is your time. Hi, uh, again, sorry. Yeah. Um, I had a question about how much writing you would recommend doing per day or per, per week uh, for someone aspiring to, um, you know, just be a writer. Yeah, I mean, um, it's hard to quantify, but I would say, I mean, and again, just different writers have different habits, but I think daily, you know, for sure. Um, and, you know, I would emphasize kind of what I mentioned earlier about how I would like throw up these obstacles to like my own creativity is I used to do that with time as well. Um, and I realized I was just being stupid. It was like, I think, oh, I've, I don't have like four hours to sit down and work on this story, so I'm not gonna do it, right? And it's like, when do you ever have four hours to sit down and like work on something, right? Um, and so again, it's just another excuse that you make for like not sitting down um, and doing the work. And so I would say daily, at least, um, just a little bit. and. You know, even if it's 15 minutes, if I can write a paragraph to get the story just a little bit farther along, um, that, like, for me, like, mentally, like, does so much. It's like, um, it keeps it fresh in my mind, and then it also just, like, you start thinking about it, right? And you're, like, you know, hanging out with friends, but you're really thinking about your story, you know? Or, like, you're driving to work, and you're thinking about your story. And keeping it fresh in your mind is really important and I think that that comes from working on it daily even if just little 15 minute chunks you know um, and not getting caught up in this idea that you have to sit down and achieve a certain word count you know so I don't know if that it's kind of a vague answer but <laughs> <laughs> but more is better always more <laughs> one last question over here sure hi there hi. um so i'm like four or five years into my own like personal novel project um oh. the issue is whenever i finish a draft of it i end up changing like major things about the story so i guess my question is how do you ultimately like decide on what the story is and how do you pretty much like stick with something without like changing everything after you've finished it yeah, that's tough. I mean, I've never had that experience myself where I've been making really like radical changes like after something is done. I mean, one thing I would add, well, one thing I would say is in the revising process, um, 
you know, it's like, do you feel like it's getting better? You know, are you, is it, you know, if you make a big change and then you go back and you read it from scratch, do you think it's actually better than it was, you know? And like, sometimes it's hard to like honestly see that or be honest with yourself, you know? Like, did I actually make this better? Um, I would say that that's one way to tell. Like, if you actually think it's, it's definitely like an improvement over what it was before, then I would stick with it and like keep doing it. Um, but also, you know, again, it kind of comes back to what we were talking about earlier about deadlines, right? Like you can keep writing forever, you know, and it's like you have to, you can fiddle with a fictional manuscript, you know, till the end of time, right? Uh, because nobody, again, there's nobody like asking for you to turn it in. Um, so, you know, I do think at a certain point it makes sense to maybe kind of like cut it off, right? And just say like, hey, this is the direction I want to go and I'm settled on this. Um, but to know that point, I mean, you got to know it yourself. I mean, there's nobody else can really tell you that, unfortunately. <laughs> so, but I would say like, if you, if you reread it and you think it's better, then you're moving in the right direction, you know? Um, and being honest with yourself, you know, you like cutting the stuff that you know isn't working, you know, is, is really, I think, key as well, you know, to making it better. So, good luck. <laughs> So here's my final question for the night. Uh -huh. uh, I want to lean into your, your day job then, because this is the one you have such deep expertise in, and we don't bring in tons of magazine or newspaper people generally. So knowing what you know now, what do you wish you knew then that would have helped you find success sooner, faster in that industry? Um, you know, it's, uh, gosh, I mean, so much. Because it's like, I, I learned it on the fly. Like, I didn't go to journalism school, and I really just kind of like learned it by doing. Um, you know, I would say the main thing is like, um, like interviewing people, like getting, like kind of, I was talking about this earlier, but like someone sitting down with you and like telling you their story, that's like a privilege, you know? And, um, you know, that can be, sometimes I think when I was younger, maybe I treated that like too lightly and, you know, didn't take that responsibility of like actually conveying someone else's story seriously enough. Um, and, you know, I think like the stories weren't as good, you know, as a result. And I think I kind of like didn't have enough respect for that process, I think. So learning like being a good interviewer, being a good listener, asking good questions, being prepared at interviews, um, you know, getting what you need out of interviews, knowing what you need to get out of interviews will save you a lot of time. Um, but for me, interviewing was definitely like the hardest thing for me to like get good at for sure. You know, writing, whatever, you can learn how to do AP style and all that other stuff, but like, having a relationship with somebody, um, extremely challenging. And the more you do it, the, the better you get at it. And you're going to screw up and make mistakes, and that's OK. Um, but I definitely wish I had been better at interviewing <laughs> when I was younger, for sure. Absolutely. Well, that's all the time we got for tonight. So help me thank Coop for coming out and sharing with us.